Now, in this section, this, this is one of those times where I'm going to go through what it means to have a Hermitian operator for a function linear vector space. This is something that, think of it again like we did with tensors. It's not going to be something that will come up a lot in the class. I'm using it to motivate why the Fourier series and the Fourier transform works the way it does. I'm preparing you for all the other special functions that you'll learn about. Um, if it makes sense, great. If it doesn't make sense, the rest of the stuff will still work. The key thing about the next 10 to 15 minutes is you need to believe me when I say that there are operators that are Hermitian, we know what they are, we know what their eigenvectors are, and therefore those are orthogonal. And sines, cosines, and e to the i, kx are three examples of orthogonal vectors that we're going to use to form Fourier series and Fourier transforms because they are eigenvectors of Hermit operators. So if the next 10 minutes don't make sense, just believe that statement I just made. <laughs> because it will help with the rest of the stuff. There are moments in physics, uh, and uh, this, is, this is a true story. I, I was in grad school. I did not understand the Fermi surface, something you will learn about. I went to one of the professors. I said, I don't get this whole Fermi surface thing. And I quote, he looked at me and said, Mike, you just use the word enough in the right place, and it will eventually make sense to you. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. I now believe I know what a Fermi surface is. <laughs> so. But it, it, there are certain things in physics where this is true, where it's a matter if you just got to be patient. You're, you're not, you can't understand it without using it. And so you have to be willing to use it before you understand it. And that's something a little different. We often try, a lot of us, we like to get the concept before we use it. And that works for a lot of things. There are some things the way you get the concept is you train your brain by using it over and over. And then it becomes intuition and it makes sense. Um, and it's just that is the way with certain of the math skills. And I think the ideas here in the linear vector spaces, a lot of them are like that. Um, and that's why some of these things cause such trouble. You just have to see it over and over and over again, and then it eventually makes sense. Now, the first key idea, therefore, is if we're going to define a Hermitian operator, we need to figure out what that means and what the pieces are. So what did it mean for a matrix to be Hermitian? Yeah, yes, that was part. But the main thing is that we actually had H. No, for the Hermitian, that was unitary. Oh. That was unitary. Hermitian is simpler, that it is equal to its conjugate transpose. That's why I had to pause for a second. <laughs> um, or, as we like to use the symbol, h dagger equals h. So the Hermitian, the Hermitian of an operator is take its transpose and conju complex conjugate. It itself is Hermitian if its transpose complex conjugate equals itself. So um, from the worksheet, for instance, we had the matrix 2i minus i2. This is Hermitian because its transpose is 2i minus i2. <coughs> so that's h. Then that's h transpose. And then if I take the complex conjugate of that, that's h transpose complex conjugate, which equals h again. So Hermitian is that its transpose complex conjugate is itself. Unitary is that. The transpose complex conjugate is the inverse. Yeah. So would it work the same way if you took the conjugate? Yeah, exactly. Works either order. You can do either first. Now, the other idea we had is we had the idea of matrix elements. We could write the ith j element of H as inner products with basis vectors. This we just called. H I J. And if you did the bonus question, you would work this out and see that this is true. And we've talked about, uh, in lecture, we did some examples where you make the matrix this way. If I connect these two, then we see an abstract notation. An operator is going to be Hermitian if this equals the complex conjugate of that. Because this is the transpose. 
I switch i and j, and this is the complex conjugate. So if this equals this, then I have a Hermitian operator. And now we see why the bras and kets are so useful, because this notation works for infinite dimensions. It's, it's, it's dimension independent, right? To do this as a matrix, if it's a finite dimension, I can write it down as an n by n matrix and just do it. If I'm talking infinite dimensional, you'll see we have to do it more abstractly. The other piece we need to keep in mind, this, this depends on a definition of the inner product. So the idea of Hermitian does go beyond just having a vector space. It requires the inner product. And our inner product definition does depend, we'll see, on our boundary conditions for our functions. Because if you recall, the inner product Fg is the integral from minus a to b of f star g dx. And so, I'm sorry, of a to b. So what's happening at the boundaries will matter. We need to know what that a and b are. Are we OK with all those pieces? So let's get fancy for a moment. When we talk about functions, we also have the same eigenvector equation, right? What, is this, what does this equation say? The matrix M times the vector is lambda times V. So let's suppose I want to do this more abstractly. How might I write this for an abstract vector using my kets? Say I have a Hermitian operator, an operator that might be Hermitian H, and I want to act on my function vector space. What might I write here? Like bra I, M, J. I don't want to go that. I just want to take this simple statement and just put it here. I'm being very trivial. And since we're f switching to my functions, I'll call it f equals lambda bar m. Yeah. So that is how I'm going to write my eigenvector equation in an abstract way. Now, if I'm talking about functions, the fundamental thing about a linear operator is it has to do what? There's a couple things it has to do. If I have a linear operator, it has to take all my vectors to what? Other vectors. Other vectors. So it can't make something that's not a vector. And it has to be linear, which means what? Right, with a, if it, a plus b is the same as it on a plus it on b. Can you name two linear operations that you can do on functions? Integrate that and Integrate and differentiate. And multiply by scalar. And multiply. <laughs> multiplying by scalar. Multiplying by another function also turns out to be linear. It gives you another function as long as you stay within the boundary conditions. So you have to be careful about that. So d by dx is a perfectly fine linear operator. So I can act with it on f of x. And I can ask, what are the eigenvectors of d by dx? Oh, I was going to have. Shh. Nobody heard that, right? <laughs> what, what are the eigenvectors, since it was said out loud? Just talk to the person next to you in case you didn't hear it and find out what they are. Wait, what does that say? Oh, that, that, that's really good scribbling for eigenvectors <laughs> of. Something is the only function that you differentiate. And we often will call these eigenfunctions because now our vectors are functions of d yeah. by dx. So it was shouted. Hopefully you <laughs> talked real quickly. What are they? E the y e to the lambda x. Yeah, I, I just solved this. It's just a, it's the simplest differential equation you can solve. What does this mean? That every differential equation, every ordinary, not every, but almost every ordinary differential equation is an eigenvalue problem. 
from a physicist's point of view, what's important in this, almost nine times out of 10, is not that this is the equation. That, I mean, this is the equation that describes a ton of stuff. And what you're interested in half the time physically is what is lambda. You're interested in the eigenvalue. You know the solution. You know the eigenvectors. Most differential equations, the way you solve in physics, is you remember what the solution was that we told you when you were an undergraduate. That's 99.9% .9 of physics when you are doing it professionally, is you already know the solution. You just don't know what the eigenvalue is for your particular problem you're doing that time. And that's what you're trying to find. Now, so we got eigenvectors. We got eigenvalues. We OK with that? This is an important step. We all good? Every real number would be an eigenvalue in this case, right? In fact, every complex number, too, if I want to be over complex numbers. But certainly every real number. The question is, is this Hermitian? Let's consider um, the set of functions from 0 to a such that f of 0 equals f of a. Let's make that our vector space. This is what we call periodic functions. From 0 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to a. And the question is this Hermitian. And what you want to ask yourself is does f h, well, actually, let's call it d because it's differentiation. We'll just write it in there, d by dx. Does f d by dx g equal g d by dx f complex conjugate? And I'm going to give you a couple of minutes on your own or with the person next to you to see if you can work that out. And turn this, I'll give you the key hint. These are all inner products. This is, says take d by dx, act it on g. That's a new vector. And take the inner product of f with this vector. And inner product is defined how? The integral. The integral. So does this f d by dx acted on g equal g acted on d by dx of f? with a complex conjugate. So take a few minutes to think about that. Does anyone have any clue what to do? If you've seen this before, it's easy. If you've never seen it before, it's incredibly hard. Let me ask you this. What does anyone have written down for that expression? Uh, integral. integral from what? Uh, from a zero, to a. 0 to a. f of x, d, g, dx, dx. That's what that is. Now, if we're being careful and these are comp potentially, potentially complex numbers, remember f gets the complex conjugate. Yeah. Now, what is g, d by dx, f equal to? Well, like the same thing, but switch the g and the f. Okay, I can do that. And I've just asked you to prove or not prove this statement up here. How would you begin to ask if this equals this? If the integrands equal each other? Well, if this were to equal to that, that would be true. Right. Take the conjugate of that integral? I could take the complex conjugate. That's one step I'm going to do. And that'll help a little bit because Obviously, I have to take the complex conjugate, so I need to do that, because that's what I really want to show is equal. Yeah. So now I'm dealing with 0a g of x df star dx. That's looking a little bit better, right? Because f star, f star g, g, I'm, I'm doing better. And now we have the main reason I'm asking us to do this derivation. Besides, it's a cool idea, and you, you're going to use it a lot in your future. There, how many of you have learned techniques of integration at one point in your life? You should all be raising your hand. You all took integral calculus. How many of you remember any techniques of integration? Which ones? Name some techniques of integration for me. By parts. By parts. And we can just stop right there. It's the only technique of integration that matters anymore. You know why? Because Mathematica exists. Any integral that you would use any other technique for, do it in Mathematica. <laughs> Don't even bother. 
I, I remember having an argument with a senior faculty member once. You know, oh, what's this mathematical stuff? You should learn it to do it the real way, the way I did it. I said, okay, and I gave him an example of an integral. He said, I said, how would you do that? He goes, oh, that's easy. I'd look it up in a table of integrals. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, and the difference with Mathematica is nothing. But integration by parts contains a fundamental physical idea that we're going to come back to. And the idea is that I can switch the derivative in my integral anytime I want. What's the only thing I have to do? I have to do two things. If I want to switch that derivative from one to the other, what do I have to do? There's two things that happen if I want to turn this integral into that integral. Integration by parts always involves what? It always involves a surface term, right? Because I'm going to do, I'm going to have a u and a dv, and then I get du and v, and it's u times v minus v du. Yeah. So I always have to worry about my surface term, which if I'm just switching the derivative is that. And then I pick up a what? A minus, because it's minus the integral of basically just switching the derivative. Now, because I am defined as a linear vector space in which f of 0 equals f of a and g of 0 equals g of a, what is this term? 0. 0, because it's periodic, right? Both of these are periodic, so their product is periodic. So the nice thing is the boundary becomes 0. And I get minus the integral from 0 to a of f star, because multiplication order doesn't matter, of that. So does this equal that? They're barely showing. No, what's the difference? It's a minus sign. It's a minus sign. So d by dx is not Hermitian for this vector space. So I do not expect, in general, its eigenvectors to be orthogonal. But so let's, if I had a different definition, it's very hard to get d by dx to be Hermitian because I'd, I'd have to come up with a really weird definition of the inner product. Now, what I could do, I could be sneaky and I could define it as the integral with an i in it. But I don't want to do that. What I want to do is define the operator with an i in it. If I change everything and make my operator i d by dx, or minus i d by dx, depending what I want to do. Oh. What's going to happen when I do the complex conjugate? You're going to get a negative. I'm going to get a negative. And what's a negative times a negative? A positive. a positive. I'm not going to write that out. I would like you, for practice, to prove to yourself that i d by dx and minus i d by dx are Hermitian. Another choice for Hermitian is d squared dx squared. Why is that Hermitian? Because I'm going to integrate by parts once. I'm going to integrate by parts a second time. And if I do that twice, what do I get? Positive. A positive. So now, if I were to ask you to solve this differential equation, minus i d, well, let's do plus i, df of x dx equals lambda f of x, what are my solutions for f of x in this case? I need an e. In this case, I actually need a minus i, I to get i times i to be negative. So I would get e to the minus i lambda x. If I did minus i df dx equals lambda f of x, I would get e to the i lambda x. Now, this seems silly. Right? We seem to be worrying about a plus or minus here, because my lambdas can be any real number. So they can be positive and negative. But you will find out. When you do Fourier transforms, you will see sometimes people use e to the i, and sometimes they use e to the minus i, and you'll be asking yourselves why. And the reason is, if you look back at it historically, underlying what they did was they were either worried about i d by dx or minus i d by dx. And in physics, we use minus i d by dx for momentum, and we get an e to the i lambda x. We use i d by dt for energy, and we get an e to the minus i omega t. 
And it's just, again, something that comes out and we use. And so when you see those different minus signs, that's what happens there. Again, key idea in here, integration by parts. You're going to use that a lot as a physicist. It's the one integration idea you really want to know. You want to be able to really understand that this is a definition of an inner product. Notice that it's such a nice shorthand instead of writing out all our big long integrals. What changes? It turns out you can, for some functions, stick different factors in here that matter. For instance, if you're working in three dimensions and you're working with angular coordinates, you would actually maybe not use just d theta here because that has the wrong units. You might use r d theta. So your definition of inner product might have an r in it. So these are things you have to worry about as it gets more complex and more advanced. But that's pretty much it. Any questions? Right. Um, so you have the integral, or, or you have g of x times uh, f star of x equals 0. But then wouldn't it also equal 0 for the other part of the integral? No, no, no. This, this is not an integral. This is just evaluating the two points I'm subtracting. But that integral, wouldn't that evaluate to 0? No. Just because something's periodic doesn't mean it has to evaluate to 0. Right? All this is saying is that the endpoints, they come back to the same value. So if I have that function, that's come back to the same value, but its integral is not going to be 0. Right? This, this is a particular statement that at this point, what I want to do is evaluate these both at a, subtract that, and evaluate them both at 0. The integral is not the function at 0 and a. It's some integral of this. No. No, I have to take the derivative of g, multiply it by f star, and do the actual integral. I don't know what this is going to be yet, oh. right? Because g is some function, f is some function. Can no, you can't, you can't cancel your dx's. Says that, well, if, if, if there is no f here, then that is just the integral of g. Okay. Yeah, then the dx is canceled. But I've got to take the derivative, multiply by f, and then integrate this whole thing. And that's why it's not going to work. 